As psychedelics hit the mainstream, a lot of us are worried that they're going to be captured by corporate interests. And lots of the controversy has been around a company called Compass Pathways, who've been accused of trying to corner the market with a very controversial patent strategy. A few days ago, I had a live debate with their president and co-founder, Lars Wild, hosted by the Oxford University Psychedelic Society. So this film includes the full unedited debate. And it's really the first time that Compass have participated in a debate like this. And we clashed over some of the key concerns in the field, like whether their patent strategy is an attempt to shut down the competition. Because of Compass's first mover advantage, and the fact that you have so much money and so much funding, you're able to, I'm not saying this is your intention, but you would be in a position where you could very easily make it very difficult for new players to enter the market. Some lawyers that I've spoken to have, have compared it to sort of uh, napalming the field and then laying landmines. So making it difficult for people to come uh, after, uh, the, after you, basically. And I think that's the main concern. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a really important question. And I would say that there, there is a fundamental misunderstanding of what we're doing. We're not napalming the field. And we also discussed our hopes for the future of the psychedelic renaissance. I want to reiterate, you know, we're, you know, we're in it to create a world of mental well-being. Uh, we're deeply focused on patients. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're in our uh, mission statement, we were saying that we're all about uh, accelerating access to evidence-based innovation and mental health. Um, our focus is on medicalization and really getting psilocybin therapy and uh, in the future other uh, therapies uh, to patients at an affordable price. My hope for the psychedelic renaissance beyond and in including medicalization is that the psychedelic the promise of psychedelics and the way they change how we see ourselves and the world um, spreads through culture i think that's the real promise of them so here's the full debate let's get started hi everybody my name is kenneth uh i'm president of the oxford psychedelic society um, this is our event, Psychedelic Capitalism. Today, we're lucky to be joined by um, two really cool guests, uh, Lars Wild, who's the president of Compass Pathways, um, and Alexander Beiner, uh, co-founder of Rebel Wisdom and co-executive director of Breaking Convention. Um, before I get started with the event, uh, I just wanted to note that the Oxford Psychedelic Society tries to make all of its events free and open to the public. Um, so if you could consider making a donation to our PayPal, that would be great. Um, Rain will send a link straight away. Um, and we also have a new line of merchandise, um, which we're selling, uh, and it, we will uh, end sales tomorrow. So you should definitely try to uh, get them while you can. Rain will also send out the link for the merch. Um, and without further ado, I'll introduce our two guests. So. Lars Wild is the President, Chief Business Officer, and co-founder of Compass Pathways, focusing on operations, digital health solutions, and fundraising. Uh, he's an active serial entrepreneur in tech and biotech and a business angel investor, and has helped to successfully build several, several companies. Before joining Compass, Lars was the founder and CEO of Springlane, a leading European direct-to-consumer kitchen and barbecue brand, and the largest German cooking magazine. He's also previously worked as an investor at Waterland Private Equity, one of the world's best performing private equity funds. Uh, in the past, he's also spent time with the Boston Consulting Group in Munich and Sao Paulo. Alexander Beiner is co-founder of Rebel Wisdom, a media platform with a quarter of a million followers and a focus on sense-making and cultural analysis. He's also a co-executive director of Breaking Convention, a psychedelic education charity, which hosts Europe's largest conference on psychedelic medicine and culture. So we're gonna do about an hour of moderated Q&A, um, followed by around 30 minutes of questions from the audience. Um, and uh, if you come up with any questions, feel free to post them in the Zoom chat. All right, great. So um, first, uh, Alexander and Lars, uh, I was thinking you could both say in your own words what your involvement is in the psychedelic space, specifically related to psychedelic capitalism. So Lars, if you could just give us a, a brief intro on Compass and what you guys are up to now, and Alexander, um, the involvement of Rebel Wisdom in psychedelics and also um, where you're currently at with Breaking Convention. Yeah, yeah, happy to. Uh, thanks for, for having me tonight and spending 90 minutes uh, with us. Um, that's fantastic. Look, Compass Pathways um, uh, is, is the original brainchild of my two co-founders, Katya and George, um, who, found, um, who founded the 
nonprofit version of Compass um, <clears throat> after uh, their son suffered from severe episodes of uh, uh, mental health suffering and they found help in ketamine and eventually uh, psilocybin and um, that got them on the path to figuring out how can we get psilocybin therapy to patients. I have a very similar story. I treated my own generalized anxiety disorder and uh, treatment resistant depression uh, with psilocybin, which got me into the space. And uh, again, I was also looking into, can we get this to patients like me um, in an above the board way? Uh, we joined forces in 2017, started the company uh, with the goal to uh, create a world of uh, mental well-being um, by driving innovation uh, to patients as quickly as possible in an affordable way. And our core focus is on treatment-resistant depression. Um, that's where we are currently running a phase 2B study uh, in 10 countries um, with the goal to very quickly progress with hopefully positive results into phase 3. Uh, and drive towards approval in uh, 24-25. Amazing. Ali? Thanks, Kenneth. Hey, Lars. And yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Really good to be here. Um, yeah, so, um, I mean, I've been involved in the psychedelic community for um, about 15 years or so, and, and been particularly interested in um, yeah, I, I suppose psychedelic mainstreaming, although no one really called it that maybe 15 years ago, it was, it was much more niche and it's really changed a lot uh, in a really short space of time. So I, um, I guess one of the, the, the first ways I was involved is um, I wrote a novel when I was in my early twenties, which um, uh, isn't amazingly good when I look back on it, but, it, but uh, it's, yeah. And so from that, you know, it was a novel around psychedelic culture and so, suppose I've always been as well really interested in, in the culture of psychedelics and what, what psychedelic culture is, what it, what it, what psychedelics offer us um, in terms of personal and cultural transformation. Um, I also care, care deeply about um, uh, medicalization as well. Um, and I've seen in my own life and, and lives of people I love how effective um, psychedelics can be for healing. So I currently um, um, one of the co-directors of Breaking Convention. So some people here might have been to Breaking Convention, uh, where Europe's largest, um, well, we host Europe's largest conference on psychedelic uh, medicine and culture. It happens at Greenwich University every two years, except with a with a COVID break. So we're back next year. Um, and uh, as well as that, through through Rebel Wisdom, I've been increasingly. Um, following the, uh, well, in fact, the first film I did around this was called The Rise of Psychedelic Capitalism. So trying to speak to many different people in the field, um, across the field from clinicians to researchers, to um, activists, uh, to economists, to try and make sense of, of what's going on, this, this very uh, rapid change um, in psychedelics. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm particularly interested in that. I'm particularly interested in, um, the promise, I think, like many of us, are the promise that psychedelics hold, but also also the risks of of this um, very different phase we're entering. So, I feel like I've been in a uh, kind of wrestling with this quite intensely for for a year or so. And, and my wife is is actually a psychedelic researcher, and, and so are many of my friends. So it's um, it's always uh, a conversation that's that's um, pretty close to me, and, and uh, one that I, I know a lot of people are wrestling with. So it, it feels good to be. Um, here having having this conversation together. Amazing. Uh, so I wanted to start with a very broad open ended question. Um, what is the current role of for profit companies in psychedelic therapy and what should it be. Ali, do you want to start. Yes, sure. Um, I have to say that's a very good question. Um, a very nicely constructed question. So I'm going to start perhaps with the what should it be? Because my short answer to that is I don't know. And I think really none of us really know how to kind of effectively bring psychedelics into the mainstream. Um, we are uh, creating it as we go. Um, and I think, I think for me, it's gonna to have to look different to what it's looked like before because psychedelics present us with kind of a paradox. They offer a fundamentally different perspective on mental health, on ourselves, on the mind, on healing. And at the same time, they're ancient, they're deeply entwined in our history. So that space of, of not knowing and coming from that space of, of recognizing that 
we don't have the models yet, in my opinion, to, to really know the answer to that question. Um, but I think what we do have is an opportunity to be innovative. And that's something I'm, I'm very interested in, to create really multidisciplinary approaches to um, the healing and, and to, to psychedelic uh, medicine and culture. So one, one of the issues, and I think this is sort of the elephant in the room in many ways, and this is where a lot of the, the tension has been in the press, is that there is a lot of tension around the tactics and approaches that are traditionally used in pharma being applied to psychedelics. And I, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to talking to Lars about Compass's role in that because Compass has been really at the center of that. Um, and my concern is that those approaches uh, won't get us to that innovative multidisciplinary space. Because even if a for-profit, and I also wanna put a flag in that, that it's not necessarily, my argument isn't, for profit or not for profit, I think both have a place. But even with the the best intentions, I think the game, the game uh, the, of of the market, will force organizations to come up against multiple double binds and also very difficult incentives that are going to put pressure on the choice of profit over ethics or what to do about competition. Shut them down, let them thrive, let them thrive at the risk of shareholder returns. Really difficult space, um, and. I also believe that not just in psychedelic medicine, but in general, and this is something we talk about on Rebel Wisdom all the time and speak to people about, is that that game, our old game that we've been playing so far for the last few hundred years is, is no longer working. We're running out of road. Um, and so what does a new game look like? And I think psychedelics, if any, if, like, if there's any approach to mental health uh, that could give us an opportunity to play a new game, it's psychedelics. And, um, what that looks like again is 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 something I'm I'm hoping that we all figure out together. But what the old game and the game theory behind it generally selects for is a movement towards monopoly, um, and it might even be that players in the space don't want to move there. But that's what the game does. That's the game pushes us towards that, and so it means we have to pursue aggressive patent strategies potentially to um, to to interfere in in some way to to lobby all the stuff that we see. And so that, that for me is an issue. And, and this, that's something I really want to kind of try and make sense of today. Um, yeah, just to kind of finish off, I mean, the, to, to zoom out a little bit, the, the story that we tell around psychedelics and how they enter the mainstream is as important to me as the fact that they're entering it in the first place. Um, Eric Davis made a really good point in, in the rise of psychedelic capitalism that psychedelics are unique in, like, in that the, the narrative we tell changes the experience we have. I can't think of anything else like that. And so if we want them to have a genuine impact on, on the mental health crisis, we have to focus on the how and not just the what. And that means looking at our values, looking at the epistemological assumptions we have, the choices we make, and coming from the space of, of humility wherever we can. Um, and and actually just the very last point is actually is, is also I think really important to bring in very early is that for me psychedelics are sacred and for many people they're sacred um, and we treat sacred things very differently in our society we treat human life as sacred and so one of the reasons we uh, we don't have drug companies charging huge amounts for COVID vaccines because there's a recognition that some things transcend the profit model um, and so that's something I think is very important to bring in. They're sacred to many indigenous cultures and they're sacred to the modern Western counterculture. So yeah, I think that's, that's where I'd like to end. It's about, we're having a conversation here about ethics. We'll probably touch on patenting and access, all really important um, questions with, without easy solutions. But I think it's, it's also about something deeper. We're also talking about purpose and we're talking about values, about what, what kind of people we wanna be. And in a sense, like what we're being called to become as psychedelics enter the mainstream. So I'll stop there. Great, Lars? Yeah, thank you, uh, Alexander. There were a lot of really, really good points in there. Um, I tried to address most of them, but uh, let me maybe get back to the question first. So I think, you know, what is the role of for-profit? I think that means we need to get back to the question, what is a company, right? A company is a group of people coming together with a common objective to achieve something. And so I think you can't just say a company is a company, right? I think uh, we as a company came together to say, look, we there's a big problem uh, in the way we treat people with mental health suffering today. And that needs changing, right? And that is what the team at Compass got behind, investors, other stakeholders. 
And that's really at the core. Now, what is the role of for-profit um, uh, or why have we chosen for-profit, right? I think that's, that's an important one. When, uh, when, when I started looking at this, right, my first thought was, okay, I'm going to go to the Netherlands. I'm going to start uh, treatment centers there. And then in the rest of Europe, I'm going to build um, centers where people are treated and the ones that do not respond to standard of care can then be referred to the Netherlands, be treated there. Um, that was my idea. Uh, Katya and George were looking at, is there a way to do this as a nonprofit and, and drive this forward? And when we met, eventually we sat down and we went through all the options of what we could do. And we said, look, you know, it's the fastest way that we know what we can do best is uh, as a for-profit model. Um, that's what we know how to execute. And in a way, our key KPI in the company is, um, you know, every 40 seconds, someone on this planet commits suicide. For every person that commits suicide, 20 people try. And we said, look, this is about speed, right? This is what we're going to be measured against. And so how can we get this to patients the fastest? And that is, that is why we said for profit. Now, I can very much relate to a lot of people that have a lot of criticism with <clears throat> capitalism. And I think the the issue that most people have is with the American model of capitalism or the Anglo-Saxon model um, in a way. Um, but that's why we've chosen a stakeholder approach. And for us, patients come first and only then profitability. And you, know, you see that in the mission of the company, which is accelerating patient access to evidence-based innovation in mental health. Um, and what we mean by that is that you have two models in pharmaceutical development. You can develop a drug and you can price it at the top of the market, uh, targeting only a few patients. Or you can price it aggressively and try to treat as many patients as possible. Now, we're very much focused on the second model. And we very much in the very early days of Compass started working with payer institutions in Europe. Before we started the company, we, we were seeking advice, not only from the European Medicines Agency of where to go with psilocybin therapy, but also uh, from payer institutions in the UK, in the Netherlands and Norway to understand what are the questions that we need to answer for psilocybin therapy to become a reimbursed treatment. Because while I guess many people on this call have access to psychedelics and to a sitter, uh, most people do not. And if we medicalize uh, psychedelics for people suffering, this will be done initially in a therapeutic context that requires therapeutic oversight. When you see what the underground therapists and the above the ground therapists in the Netherlands char are charging, you see that it's a couple of thousand per session. Now that means if this treatment would not be reimbursed, there's no way that a large majority of people suffering from mental health disorders would be able to access that. And so that's why we said, look, we need to build this into the company from the very beginning. We build out a commercial team that's working with payer institutions, both in North America and in Europe. And uh, then again, you know, very concretely, what does it mean to be a for-profit entity? Uh, it's really an organization that can take in investor money and redistribute it into research. And that's what we're doing, right? We're running um, the largest psychedelic uh, trial on the planet. Uh, we're going to la launch a study in for several studies in phase three um, that, that hopefully makes psilocybin as quickly accessible to patients as possible. Hopefully someone in 2024, 2025 with all the insecurities running clinical trials, but that's what we what we aim for. And then in a way I can very much relate with what, what Alexander said, right? I think, you know, there are companies, they need to have strong uh, ethical values. They need to be baked into the company. And I think that's that's where we are and that's where our heart sits. Amazing, thank you, Lars. Um, there's a lot to get into here. I wanted to touch on one of the points that um, Alexander made, which is that psychedelics are sacred substances. Um, they're not just another pill. They have this extraordinary capacity to create life-changing spiritual experiences. Um, so I'm wondering, Lars, if you could answer the question of how we honor the spirit of psychedelics when turning into medication, how we ensure that it doesn't just become another pill that you take. Yeah, that, that is a great question. Um, and there there's, you know, as we all know, psychedelics are a very unique experience um, and, and it varies wi widely from uh, patient or, or participant, if you want to, to participant, right? In that it depends very much on, on your personal frame, your cultural heritage, what you're gonna experience. Now, where we are uh, have made a commitment is that we're very agnostic. Uh, so we have a 
mindfulness-based uh, therapy approach uh, to psychedelic therapy and um, the therapists are not superimposing their worldview on whatever the patient experiences in our therapy, but whatever the patient experiences through psilocybin is exactly the right experience for that uh, patient. And we work with that and make sure that the patient integrates exactly that uh, perspective. And as you know, it's very difficult to influence the experience, right? It's um, uh, in that sense, I don't think that there's a lot we can do about it. We, where we are focusing is really preparing the patients appropriately that they can be open to the experience engage with the experience and then work with them afterwards so that they can integrate that experience uh, in their lives and take it into their uh, everyday normal um, uh, normal life Ali, I'm curious how you think that integration can be uh, integrated uh, into psychedelic therapy um, how is it that we ensure that you know, after someone has an extraordinarily revelatory experience with psychedelics, they can actually keep that in their everyday day-to-day -day life afterwards. Yeah, I mean, I'll comment on that. There's a few things I also wanted to pick up on if that's all right, um, just so we don't lose lose any threads, but- uh, Yeah, feel um, free to respond to any of the threads. Sure, yeah, so I think I think integration as, as well as, um, consisting of various techniques is also an attitudinal thing. And that, that can be built in to, um, into the way that protocols are designed because it, you know, increasingly people are noticing that it's, it's, you know, there's a malleability and a neuroplasticity that the psychedelic experience gives us. And with good therapy can be even, even more neuroplastic and, and have a lot of impact, but it's really the, um, the behavioral changes afterwards. And so that's, that's also a, you know, I know in the Imperial study, a, a lot of um, patients had the expectation because of what they read in the press that they were gonna have a brain reset, for example, right? So there's a culture around this will reset your brain, which is of course not true. You can't just fix your problems, right? This is, and psychedelics will not just fix your problems, um, which is, um, you know, often uh, arguably what um, a kind of a medical model uh, version of psychiatry um, can, not always, but can push people towards. Um, so I think there's, yeah, there's, there's, there's something about building that into the culture around psychedelics, which I think is really important as well as the actual um, practices. But um, I, I would be keen to just go back to, to this kind of question we started on and just ask a few things to Lars around the, I noticed that the, um, the the word fastest um, and the kind of energy of which I understand in a sense of you know we have a mental health crisis people are suffering and th they don't have the processes or medicines they need necessarily but it, this goes back to my um, my concerns around innovation in the space which I would love to talk about because um, you know, I think we have to address the fact that, you know, there's been a lot of pushback uh, in the press around Compass's patent strategy. And the main concern, uh, one of them, I think, uh, which would be really good to talk about is the fact that the, the patenting a polymorph of psilocybin um, is, isn't quite the same as a new chemical entity in many people's minds. So that, that's one thing. But the other thing is that because of Compass's first mover advantage, and the fact that you have so much money and so much funding, you're able to, I'm not saying this is your intention, but you would be in a position where you could very easily make it very difficult for new players to enter the market. Because if I want, if I want to start a psilocybin a company, I have to go to a VC now, and they not only do I have to get funding from, my, from the VC, but I have to get funding in case you sue me for potentially having your polymorph. And it is, incredibly expensive for me to get the experts required to look at polymorph chemistry, which is very, very difficult, requires lots of expensive machinery, lots of experts. So, you know, I've, you know, some lawyers that I've spoken to have, have, have compared it to sort of uh, napalming the field and then laying landmines. So making it difficult for people to come uh, after, uh, after you basically. And I think that's the main concern. I think it's not so much profit or you know, some people are concerned about capitalism. Um, I don't think capitalism perfect, but I wouldn't consider myself an anti-capitalist. I consider myself an entrepreneur as well. But I think it's around um, it's around whether other people can play the game too. 
and that that's something I'd really just love to um, talk about now because I think it's kind of uh, key to everything else. Yeah, no, it's a it's a really important question, and I would say that there there is a fundamental misunderstanding of what we're doing. We're not not harming the field. Um, maybe I start because I think that's in the interest of the wider group here. Uh, historically, you know, how did our patent strategy come about? What are we doing? So initially, um, when when we tried to synthesize psilocybin to support the studies, we um, you know we tried to work with other groups that claimed they had. Uh, synthesized psilocybin that turned out not to be true and so we took it upon ourselves to develop a synthesis for psilocybin or actually initially work through the existing syntheses. Now what we learned by doing that is that the existing syntheses are not up to modern day standards so we weren't able to produce CGMP psilocybin which is required to run clinical trials and, and that's why we uh, first developed a new synthesis. Now in doing so we realized that the prior art did not hold the solution uh, on, and on how to um, manufacture a significantly large batch sizes of psilocybin as required by FDA, EMA, and so forth. And so, you know, solving a lot of problems along the way, uh, we, we protected uh, the synthesis that we had developed where we spent uh, significant uh, investment on. And then when we eventually decided which uh, uh, of the polymorphs to develop, uh, we found one that we found suitable for our drug product. Uh, and when analyzing that, we realized that that polymorphic form had not been described uh, in the uh, prior art, in the work that had been done by Sandoz or anyone else. And now maybe very briefly, what is, um, what is a polymorph? Uh, polymorph is a certain salt form uh, of a, a chemical entity. And uh, so that is what we protected. Um, so uh, that is really what our patent strategy is, uh, is based on. Um, and then there are related claims of how you formulate that specific polymorphic form into a drug product and what indications you use to uh, treat um, with that drug product. Now, when people say we're really broad, I would say that they should talk to their favorite patent lawyer. Uh, that is not a broad uh, patent strategy, but what it allows us is it protects the innovation that we have created. Now, why is that important? Um, first of all, there's the understanding that people can just go about and take any idea and patent it. That's impossible. So anything that has been developed by Sandoz Pharmaceuticals or any other researcher, et cetera, is not patentable. It's prior art. And then some people make the argument and say, yeah, but you know, if, you're, if you have great patent lawyers and very, very smart, there might be patent offices where you can sneak through with such a strategy. That might be true, but not with uh, uh, four patent offices amongst the leading in the world, including the US Patent Office, the UK Patent Office, German Patent Office, Hong Kong Patent Office. So what that means is they have reviewed the prior art. They have decided that what we have done uh, is innovative, hasn't been done before. Uh, so it requires the novel and inventive uh, step. Um, why is that important to us? Because otherwise, you know, we would be spending hundreds of millions uh, to develop psilocybin. Uh, through clinical trials to come to market. And uh, as soon as the regulatory uh, protection expires, uh, we would have severe competition from generics, uh, the Tevas of this world that would come in with hugely uh, efficient operations that would flood the market uh, with psilocybin, uh, competing away any uh, profitability uh, with uh, psilocybin. Now that is not in the interest of the overall field because if that happens, then all the companies that, that Alexander, you mentioned and um, that are now started up looking at other indications with psilocybin, DMT, 5-MeO, et cetera, they will not be able to raise money uh, because then people will realize that there is no way that these investor, uh, 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 these investments will ever be returned. Now without the, um, uh, with the return objective, it's really difficult for investors to say, look, we're gonna invest into late stage clinical trials, which cost hundreds of millions. Last thing I'm gonna say is, uh, luckily for the field, um, there has been amazing work done by Sasha Shulgin and David Nichols and many other amazing uh, psychedelic chemists uh, that have put a lot of information, novel chemical entities out in the uh, public domain. And that's why you see that explosion. I think by now there are 250 psychedelic companies out there that are developing different psychedelics for different indications. And 
you know, I think to some extent we have made this possible that people realize you can actually develop these. There's enough investor interest and to take these substances through clinical trials. And that's really the focus of what we're doing. Go ahead, Ali. Yeah, thank you, Lars, for um, explaining a little bit more. I, I mean, it's worth mentioning that both the patent system and polymorph chemistry are super complicated. <laughs> I've spent <laughs> ages looking at like, looking at it, but um, I, I think it would help as well because I think there's another aspect of this which has been um, reported a lot, which is the like what what are Compass's sort of intentions with different indications? Because there have been patent applications and for, for basically like, you know, many different indications, uh, anorexia, even non-medical things like kind of cognitive enhancement, but things related to that. So there's debate as to whether a patent office, you know, there's a line in, in one of them, a psilocybin or an active metabolite thereof uh, in one of your patent applications. So I guess what people are concerned about is that um, a patent office somewhere in some country may well look at your polymorph, which is, a kind of temporary crystalline form of psilocybin, which sort of disappears once it kind of enters the body, it just becomes the same psilocybin the Mazatec we are, you know, we're using or that you find in fields in October here in, uh, in certain places in the UK. Um, and that then there would be a kind of, uh, a kind of perceived ownership of, of Compass over those indications. So I think that's where a lot of concern is. It'd be great to just hear, yeah, yeah, what, what your guys' intention is with it. Yeah. That's a great question um, because we, we've been, you know, as many people in this call, we, we met a lot of people uh, during the, our time with Compass that claimed all kinds of things of what psilocybin might be able to do, right? It might treat anorexia, it might treat cognitive decline, it might treat all kinds of inflammation issues, et cetera. And we actually put that to the test. Uh, so we are undertaking a broad preclinical program to answer the question of what is the mechanism of action for which psilocybin has all these um effects if they exist so first question do they exist and then question is how um and uh, you know we're undertaking that with a very large team we've completed i believe uh, 20 studies by now or more um and we found that indeed psilocybin is a transdiagnostic tool uh, that can be used in many uh, many indications um some of which have never been reported in the public domain and so with that finding, we were able to uh, file for method of use uh, protection in these indications. Now, what that means is that uh, we have the freedom to develop uh, psilocybin in these indications. You mentioned a couple of the ones that we are actually actively looking at, like anorexia, bipolar, uh, we're actively pursuing. Um, and then there are others that we might not actively pursue. Now, you know, we would be open to partnering with other uh, entrepreneurs that are going to be looking at uh, other indications that fall outside of our scope of interest. Uh, to date, we haven't been approached by anyone looking to partner with us. I wanted to um, move on to another aspect of patents within psychedelic therapy. Um, so I'm curious to get both of your takes on what aspects of psychedelic therapy you think should be patented. Obviously, yeah. psychedelic therapy is something that's been around uh, underground for, for many, many years and also in indigenous cultures. Um, some of Compass's uh, past uh, claims in patent applications have included things like whether or not the room comprises soft furniture, whether the room is decorated using muted colors and other things. Um, why does Compass have a right to patent those things if they've been around in psychedelic therapy for so long? Yeah, you know, thanks for giving me that, uh, that question because that is something that uh, I absolutely want to put in the public domain. You know, we're not uh, we're not patenting room furnishing, color, soundtracks, uh, whatever else falls into that. What what you're referring to is our PCT applications that also describe set and setting. Uh, we believe that uh, in the medicalization, these substances should be delivered safely, and there's a lot of knowledge. Um, but I you know I want to make that public on record here. Uh, we're we're not going to enforce anything related to uh, to set and setting. Go ahead, Ali. Yeah, so I mean, just, just broadly on that question, I think there's a big difference. And I think most of the people I've spoken to for, for my films and just in general feel very differently about patenting new chemical entities 
uh, like say uh, an analog of MDMA without the come down, which I'm sure we'd all be grateful for. Um, and um, also uh, pre-existing molecules like psilocybin. And I think that's why the polymorph is contentious because it's, it's a pre-existing molecule. Um, so the, the aspects of the psychedelic experience, um, I think of course shouldn't and can't really be patented. Um, you know, things that have been around since uh, their, their prior art anyway, all of those methods have been around. And arguably that, that kind of ceremonial approach is borrowed from, from uh, indigenous cultures around the world as well. So I, I don't think it can, I don't think most patent offices would, would do that. Um, but the, um, it, yeah, it is an interesting question of, of what, will, what will or won't be patented. And I think it's gonna come down probably to courts. I just wanted to, to maybe get your thoughts, Lars, on um, Christian Angermeyer, who's, who's um, one of your investors, um, because I noticed in the chat, someone's asking about this and it's something I wanted to kind of raise as well. He, he wrote in an email that was in Vice, uh, which was kind of leaked. I expect, a, I expect a starting differentiation between solid players in the psychedelic space. And to be honest, I really just see a tie and compass and copycats. Most of these copycats miss one important thing, patents. Many psychedelics companies out there will never be able to bring a product to market as they will hit the patents of Compass and a tie. So, I mean, I think within the context of us talking about what can and can't be patented, I just wonder about your your thoughts on that. Like, what does hitting the patents mean? What like what 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 is he referring to? What do you understand by that? I don't know what he means by that uh, because he's simply an investor. We're a public company, so he has uh, zero insight into our patent strategy and any of the inner workings of the company. Uh, I'm obviously aware of that uh, email, uh, which seems very promotional to me, but um, uh, yeah, he's not a spokesperson of the company. So uh, it's really not our opinion that's uh, represented there. That's fair enough. Um, I actually wanted to take one of the questions from the audience since it's pertinent to this. Uh, this is from Rebecca Harding. How is aggressively patenting various protocols helping widen access to psychedelics, which you say is your main ambition, supposedly with Compass Pathways? Um, and uh, how does uh, you know, protecting your innovation through patenting not inadvertently end up blocking access for, for other psychedelic companies um, to create their own therapies and medications? Yeah, I think the first one I answered Right. What I said is that, you know, we're not patenting room colors or laying down or putting on eye shades and earphones. Uh, and I mean, Alexander summarized it really well, right? This is in the public domain. Uh, this is not something that will uh, be ever enforced. Now, the other question is, how does it um, help with access? And I think that's a bit more of a complicated question um, that, um, that requires a longer answer, right? So again, I think uh, without any protectable business model, um, it won't be possible for any of these companies to raise the required funding, which, you know, if you look at treatment resistant depression, we're talking somewhere between three to 500 million to get psilocybin approved, right? If you think about all the other indications where people would benefit from psilocybin therapy, similar amounts of money will be required for that. Now, without a defensible uh, business model, no one will raise these, uh, this amount of money. I think when you think about, you know, what, who's going to deliver psychedelic therapy, we're already now seeing an explosion of providers, right? You see in the U.S. a lot of ketamine clinics uh, being set up that are looking to integrate MDMA, next generation TMS, psilocybin, whatever else comes down through the uh, uh, clinical pipeline. And you're going to see a lot of uh, uh, interesting developments on the provider uh, side of things that will grant access. Now, the question is, you know, how can we very quickly develop psilocybin so that these providers can uh, can tr start treating patients. And um, that is where we are focused, right? I think that's one of the things that also has been maybe uh, at some time, uh, at some point in time being misunderstood. We're not going directly into the delivery. We're gonna be the partner uh, of delivery groups. Um, you see a lot of uh, new entities being set up to deliver treatments. The situation in Europe is different. We still, uh, you know, the uh, we're looking to partner with existing healthcare systems like the NHS and, uh, Priory Group, Virgin, uh, Media, and all, a lot of other uh, potential partners in Europe uh, that then can deliver these treatments at scale uh, to patients because patients can't wait. Um, I wanted to shift gears because uh, the discussion on psychedelic capitalism is multifaceted. Um, and I wanted to ask, 
uh, specifically about how you think that um, we can create specific measures to uh, avoid uh, exploitation of indigenous uh, lands and culture. This is a question taken from Valeria in the audience. Um, how is it that, that um, Western psychedelic medicine in a for-profit context can respect um, uh, past indigenous cultures that have used uh, psychedelic medicine? I'll let Alexander answer that first. Sure, yeah, I mean, I think I, I've come across, again, this is not to say my main area of expertise, but I have been speaking to people and, and kind of come across um, various different models. Um, one is some kind of um, reciprocality to indigenous groups uh, where, where these um, practices came from. I think it's um, I think it's an important idea. I also think it's difficult to implement and I think it's quite new. So I think there's a lot more work to be done in, in kind of figuring out um, what that looks like and, and how it works. I see it as applying particularly to ayahuasca um, and potentially psilocybin, but in, in different ways. Um, and there's also a, the, the, it, it raises a really interesting question as well, because it raises the question of what worldview are we selecting for as psychedelics enter the mainstream? If I have a psychedelic experience in a clinic or now in a clinical trial, and I have a past life experience, or I have a, a, a you know, an encounter with an entity, what ontology, what worldview am I going to be making sense of it through? You know, probably not CBT because it's like it's a bit out of the, out of the realm, right? Um, maybe Jungian, uh, Jungian model, but um, there are many, many different models out there from different cultures. Um, and in a sense, there's a, there's a kind of, um, there's a tension between our worldviews, um, well, between worldviews, let's say. So it's a mistake to import, like say a Shapibo model and mix it with a bit of Buddhism and a bit of Hinduism and create some kind of um, mishmash worldview and have people try and interpret the experience through that. And I think it's also a mistake to only use our, our frames. And so there's a, there's a certain, um, I think, importance of respecting and honoring and really genuinely listening to indigenous uh, ways of knowing. Um, and what that looks like practically on the ground, um, it, it kind of remains to be seen. But uh, maybe I'll pass over to Lars. Yeah, no, it's a it's a really complicated field, right? Um, uh, to think about uh, reciprocity here, and you know, what which, which cultures are you looking at? Um, obviously, mushrooms have been used around the world. Uh, I mean, they have been used uh, by our ancestors in Europe as well. So uh, that that's one thing to consider. Um, so at the moment at Compass, we're very much focused on uh, running clinical trials and answering the question of how, how can we generate access uh, for patients. Uh, that's at the core. Obviously, we were taking in these, uh, I want to say, feedback points to think about, you know, is that something that we want to engage with in the future? Um, uh, and and we like to be in the discussion. Uh, at the moment, we don't have a good answer for that question. So just to elaborate actually on, on a point that Ali was making, uh, Lars, does Compass make any effort to create a certain kind of worldview through which you can frame the experiences you have on psychedelic therapy or medicine, or is that just not, has that just not been developed yet? No, I think, look, this again is, uh, uh, we feel very strongly about that any any patient's experience is the right uh, experience to work with with that individual patient. And, and as Alexander said, right, it can be very different from patient to patient. Uh, so the focus is really on uh, processing the experience, uh, integrating the patient's very experience and uh, helping them to make sense of that experience and what that means for their life specifically. So it's a very individualized approach. Yes. Kenneth, could I um, return to a previous point? Would that be okay? Absolutely. Go for I'm it. noticing, again, stuff in the chat. Yeah. I'm just keen to kind of get a kind of a bit of collective intelligence going. Yeah. Um, but the... We we have we should have already talked about alternatives to the for-profit model as as we know it, um, and there are many. And as people are pointing out in the chat, there is USONA, who have an a commitment to open science, who are also in in phase two and also have a, uh, a synthesis of psilocybin, and then of course there's MAPS, um, and uh, you know MAPS is a great example of what can be done. Uh, philanthropically and with things like data exclusivity, which is something Rick Doblin argues for, rather than patents, having the kind of exclusive control of your data and being able to um, 
to uh, profit and, and be paid for the risk you've taken through that. I think that is something I would love to talk about with Lars because the, the model of the pharma model where you get rewarded for the risk you take is, is usually for bringing a new drug to market. But, but again, psilocybin is not a new drug. It's a, it's a pre-existing molecule. And so I'm not saying that Compass hasn't taken any risk, but I'm saying that the risk that you've taken is not the same as, as the risk of bringing a completely new drug to market. Um, perhaps you disagree with that, but I would, I would love to hear, Lars, about the alternatives that are out there, um, in, including USONA, for example. Yeah, there were a couple of questions in that. Um, yeah, no, let, let's maybe talk about MAPS first, right? Uh, what a tremendous success. Been talking to the MAPS team earlier today, and uh, I'm obviously a big fan of their work. Um, they have a good chance of getting MDMA across the finish line uh, within the next, uh, call it two years. And um, they have done that in an amazing fashion, right, as a nonprofit. Uh, I think what I would say is the it took them quite some time, right? Um, uh, we're talking about 35 years here uh, to get to the point. And I think when we looked at it, we said, look, it's, it's going to be very, very difficult for us to raise the amounts of funding required in depression studies with much larger patient numbers required due to the uh, variability, uh, the intersubject variability that you have to raise these funds um, uh, philanthropically. We didn't know how to do it. And um, I think Rick has a really good point, right? Focus on data exclusivity. We're doing the same. Um, uh, obviously, any uh, drug that's been developed to market will, uh, uh, that's a new drug, uh, will enjoy the data exclusivity. So MDMA is a new drug um, because uh, it hasn't been developed all the way to market. Um, similarly, uh, cybercyber will be, uh, from the regulatory perspective of the FDA, MHRA, uh, EMA be a new chemical entity, new active substance, um, which lets us uh, access uh, data exclusivity. And um, look, I think, you know, I applaud all models, right? If, uh, if another, if, if USONA is successful um, with developing psilocybin and major depressive disorder, that's phenomenal for patients. Um, so uh, best of luck with that. Uh, we know that it takes a lot of work, uh, especially on not only running the clinical trials, because I feel that there are two ways where, <clears throat> or there are three ways where any drug could fail, right? One is can't be safe, can't be efficacious, and it can't be commercialized. Now, I think most people on this call would probably say that psilocybin has a good chance of being safe and efficacious. So where psilocybin could fail is on the commercialization front. And uh, what I mean by that is, can we get it to patients? And again, to get it to patients, um, you cannot only run uh, regulatory relevant studies, but you actually need to run studies that allow you uh, to see what the uh, utility for healthcare systems of providing that treatment will be. Now, those are much larger studies required because at the current in the current situation is, you know, you're depressed, you go to your GP, the GP says, oh, you're, you're not feeling well, we're going to give you an SSRI. Now, the SSRI doesn't work, you come back, you're going to be put on another SSRI or an SNRI, if that doesn't work, tricyclic. Um, uh, or atypical antipsychotic. <clears throat> the problem with that is these drugs are all genericized, um, so they're very cheap. And the problem is that cytosine will have to be compared against that on an efficacy weighted uh, basis. That's why we're very much focusing on treatment resistant depression. That's where the cost for the system is the highest. So, the direct cost of a patient suffering with treatment resistant depression is between 17 to 25,000 US dollars a year. Since so these patients do not uh, improve, that's a recurring cost. And that's what we're focusing on uh, on the commercial side is running the clinical trials that are required to also generate that evidence. And, and that creates a large part of the cost, right? And I feel that um, the comparison between MAPS and, and COMPASS uh, is in so far incorrect that MAPS is going after uh, chronic PTSD, which does not have any accepted treatment. Uh, so they're going to be first in class. They can demand any price. Uh, the treatment is going to be very expensive. When you think about it, it's three MDMA sessions, two therapists with a lot of therapy before and after. And, um, and, and they will be able to probably charge for it uh, with some health insurances. Um, the goal here must be to create something uh, similar in a much more competitive field um, where existing drugs are out there for treatment resistant depression, where we need to show we can be uh, competitive. Again, you know, many, many roads lead to Rome. Um, 
And you know, the, the one that we understood the best is the one that we're pursuing. That doesn't mean that others might not work, right? Um, just on that, I'd love to pick up on that. Um, the the another model which is is neither the pharma profit model or not for profit model is is the Oregon model. Um, and Oregon is currently in the phase of, of having um, uh, legalized psilocybin for therapeutic use now in the in the phase of um, figuring out how to best do it. It's coming through the state healthcare. Um, and that is a completely different model. And Lars, I wonder, like, I'm curious whether you are worried about that model, because does it just realistically, doesn't it pose a, if other states start rolling that out and the model shifts from the clinical trial model, bring drug to market to natural psilocybin um, and, and, you know, being used by trained therapists funded by the state, um, yeah. that seems to be quite a threat um, to you guys. Yeah, no, I, I disagree. Um, it's a good point that you bring it up, but I, I, I disagree, right? It's, it's an alternative model. Um, and I think the people of Oregon have voted, uh, you know, so, so kudos to them. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the issue that you're going to have here is if you not, don't develop a drug through the regulatory models, um, the health insurances will not reimburse it. So while it might be great, depending on what, whatever the model shapes out to be in Oregon, that some people can access it, the question is still, you know, if a patient has to access psilocybin therapy a couple of times uh, with a therapist, let's let's do a quick calculation. Let's say you keep it very lean, right? You have only one therapist, you have two preparatory sessions, uh, you have two integration sessions, and the day is maybe eight hours, right? That gives you a total number of 12 hours. And the average cost of a therapist in the US is somewhere between 100 and uh, $200 uh, an hour. So the average psilocybin session will cost between 1,200 and 2,400 US dollars. The question is, you know, who, who can really afford that, especially, you know, maybe a few times a year, it's going to be far in between that people can access that. Now, it's a great model for the people that can afford it. Uh, that's not what we're focused on. Uh, we're focused on the average depressed person um, that we want to want to support, right? And uh, for that, our view is we need to develop it through the medical model. And there will be very many other models, right? I think I'm applauding decriminalization, right? I think no one should go to jail. I think the decrim model is a bit misguided because very few people go to jail for psychedelic use. Most people go to jail for if, if they are, you know, black, uh, they go to jail because of marijuana use or crack cocaine use. That's really the majority of people in jail, but in the United States. And, and I think, you know, it's great that drugs are increasingly decriminalized. That's where the focus should be. You're going to have probably a recreational use model uh, where people will have other ways to access it. You see that in the Netherlands, a lot of centers are flourishing there, synthesis, et cetera. They are overbooked. Again, the sessions cost thousands uh, of uh, dollars uh, and that limits access, right? The only thing that will provide access is reimbursement. Um, and again, that's what we're focused on. I also feel that the bait is uh, in kind of the psychedelic world. It's very much US centric, right? And, you know, who knows how the US situation will shape up but if we look at uh, at europe right when when we think about the uk and germany and the other larger european countries they can't even legalize cannabis right so what are the chances that such a model will be successful in europe very slim and so i feel that for patients at the moment the biggest chance is to go through the medical route um, do the work required work with the system deliver the data uh, and get the treatments approved that's our focus Overall, I think, you know, we're all in the same boat, right? Uh, we want to get psychedelics across the finish line. They're different approaches and uh, there's not going to be a monopoly. I'm sure of that. So there are going to be others out there. Um, but yeah, I, I'd love to know, Alexander, what, what is the alternative model? Let's say, you know, there was no compass and there was no psychedelic renaissance movement. You know, how would you think this could get to patients successfully? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean... As best as I understand it from, from the research I've been doing, I mean, I think USONA's model is one that I can see working. The, the other thing is that I notice a lot, of, uh, a lot of what you're saying is around a strategy of speed um, and kind of getting it rolled out a qu a quicker rather than slower. I personally don't think that's a good idea um, because I don't think we're ready for it. And I don't think our existing systems are set up for that. 
I, I like the work of Bennett Zellner, uh, who's an economist who's worth checking out. He talks about the pollination approach, which is where we have much more of a grassroots um, focus. And we, we actually speak to the underlying causes of the mental health crisis, which are to do as much, depending on who you talk to, with a, a deep lack of meaning and purpose in culture, a deep sense of economic disenfranchisement, a, a loss of connection, a loss of community. We're seeing in, in a lot of studies that it, it's, it's, you know, as beautiful and amazing as, as uh, psychedelic assisted therapy is, it's not really just that, and it alone even doesn't work. It's also connection, connection to other people, connection to community, um, a reason to do what you do, a reason to get up in the morning, um, we, we live in a culture which for one of the first times in history, we don't really know what our culture is for or where we're meant to be going. So there are big, big, there's a meta crisis and a meaning crisis. So, but and on the practical level, I think the, well, yeah, again, something like Usona's model, something like many different players in an IP commons. Um, and that's, you know, the question is, the question of, of pricing, I think, is, is an interesting one. I think the idea of the insurance model, I, I know Shayla Love has questioned that in one of her vice pieces. You know, she, she argued that it's a bit of a red herring because in the US, insurers are notoriously bad at covering psychotherapy and network. Um, so it doesn't you know, inherently insure coverage and it doesn't ensure that people who have health insurance in the first place or insurance with low enough deductibles to access coverage. And likewise, in, in the UK with the NHS, for example, you know, the NHS has problems with certain cancer drugs because only one company has a monopoly on it. So let's say you did have exclusivity for, say, five or 10 years, and it was only compass psilocybin available in the UK, um, you would be in a position potentially to charge what you wanted to the NHS. And either they say yes or they don't do it. I, I'd be curious, what, what would you want to charge? You know, because if, you know, because if that model is, is indeed the best, it, it, yeah, how, how does that work? How do you, do you make a decision to charge an ethical amount? Who decides what's an ethical amount? Yeah. Yeah, great question. And I just want to say I have a hard time following the chat. And I try to focus on you, Alexander, when you speak. So maybe, Kenneth, you can call out the more interesting questions in the chat. I'm sorry that I'm not reading all of them. I just Absolutely. saw one on uh, there was also touching on the, on the health insurance uh, part. And I think, you know, this is something that's um, uh, that's very relevant because I think uh, in Europe we will uh, absolutely get to a model right where people we will you know if psilocybin turns out to be a good uh, therapy for patients uh, we will find a way to get it reimbursed and to patients and then the question is you know will entrepreneurs and existing set, uh, systems quickly enough set up treatment rooms and centers to actually deliver the treatment and we try to support that but that's not what compass will be doing so I hope other entrepreneurs uh, will be very active in that the other market that is or, or the only market in the western world that's really a huge problem is the united states uh, because of a broken healthcare system um where indeed people that probably need psilocybin therapy the most will have a problem issuing it uh, is, uh, accessing it because of an under insurance problem or no insurance and that is something that you know we're we're thinking about and how to address that and thinking through solutions for that now it's not our fault that the healthcare system in the united states is broken uh, but I think for us, it's important to mention we're we're looking our, for a solution, um, uh, and and that will very much depend on going to your question. What will be the pricing, right? I think we're very committed. Uh, I think it's one of the first sentences in in our mission to to access, uh, which means affordable pricing. Um, that's every that's the focus of everything that our commercial unit is doing at the moment. Um, it it hugely depends on the results of the phase two B uh, and our long term follow up study which will answer, you know, what is the average duration of the antidepressant response? How much do we lower the cost for the system um, uh, so that we can, can answer reliably what the pricing of that uh, therapy might be? Unfortunately, we don't have the data yet. Uh, we're uh, very excited, waiting for it. will be with us hopefully before the end of the year. Uh, and we hope that we then have a bit of a better understanding. Finally, that answer will only be given in the phase three uh, once we know, uh, know more about uh, efficacy. Uh, and, and long-term durability. Great. Um, 
I did promise that we would have uh, at least 30 minutes of questions asked from the audience, which I already did try to integrate into the discussion. We've got a lot of questions from the audience. Um, I first wanted to start off with uh, an audience member who happens to be right next to me. Uh, <laughs> Tiffany, do you wanna ask your question? Yeah, I do. Hi, uh, it's <laughs> nice to meet you both. Um, this is such an awesome discussion. I think, uh, shout out to Valeria in the chat. You've been asking some questions that I also have. Um, I and I appreciate Lars the honesty of your own narrative. Um, I sort of try to endorse that in my own life. I am a medicinal marijuana patient, and sort of firsthand experience for my own conditions how you know substances that are scheduled move from FDA approval to adoption, and then ultimately to someone like me. Um, and it isn't a pretty picture. <laughs> so I guess I'm trying to think about you know, realistically, how do we avoid what happened with weed and what happened with K? What happened with, you know, medical marijuana and what happened with medical ketamine? Um, because obviously it's, you know, super complex, but I can't help but think there's just so much about, you know, how we interface with regulatory bodies and not just talking about, you know, in the USA, obviously there's the complexity of state level um, regulation of these substances as well, but um, you know, patients in long-term care facilities with marijuana in their pockets, with medicinal marijuana program, are, are being removed from their long-term care facilities for possessing marijuana because it's a scheduled drug, which makes no sense, right? So I'd love to think through with you guys, you know, how can we interface with regulatory bodies to, to prevent what happened with weed and K? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think there are some similarities, but there are also a lot of differences, I would say, because, you know, let's take, um, take marijuana, where you, you have the natural plant, right? And that has been first decriminalized in some states in the United States, and then medical use of the flower has been made available. And so that took a lot of incentive away from research. So while you have that major explosion of uh, cannabis accessibility in the United States, um, the issue is that you have very little research uh, happening uh, with marijuana. Um, there are only, uh, you know, I believe three major pharmaceutical companies left in the space exploring what these compounds do. And that means that there is no funding. And so people moved on. And so what you're left with are the Tilrays and the Afrias of the world that are trying to create fancy new edibles and combination of things without actually researching it. And I believe the cannabis plan has a lot to offer for patients. And it's actually a pity that it's not being explored. And I hope the same doesn't happen to, uh, to psychedelics, right? If, if you take away the motive to fund research, you're not going to get the answers. And you know, maybe you get to some patients, but you're not going to get uh, the big answer of what these substances would be able to do. I think you, you also mentioned ketamine. I think for ketamine, uh, it's a similar situation in that uh, a lot of off-label use has happened. And... Uh, uh, people have started paying out of pocket for it. Some insurers have, uh, in, the, in the States have started to pay for racemic ketamine. Um, Janssen, uh, pharma arm of Johnson Johnson, developed uh, S-ketamine. Now they were suddenly coming into a market where the psychiatrists make much more money from selling racemic ketamine out of pocket, where they charge 600 a pop. They pay 50 cents for a vial of ketamine. So their net profit is 600 for the administration. So they don't want to deliver uh, as ketamine. So as ketamine, which is reimbursed, didn't make it to patients because the providers in that case said, look, I make a lot of money and with my little practice here, charging people out of pocket. So I'm not interested in, uh, in providing as ketamine. Now, I think that situation is rectified. I believe that now some of the, uh, uh, some of the insurers are starting to pay for the administration uh, actually of Spravato, which is as ketamine and so that will then facilitate that actually these sites can deliver as ketamine and so that it actually reaches the people that need it. And so there's a lot of, to be learned from these cases uh, for all of us in psychedelics on how to get it right. And so we're obviously deeply analyzing these cases to not make the same mistakes again. Ali, did you want to touch on that briefly as well? Yeah, just briefly. I mean, again, there's, this, there's a question of what are we mainstreaming psychedelics for? Are we mainstreaming them to fix a problem that we perceive? Because if, if we're doing that, then I think we're gonna be sitting here in 20 years talking about the fact that the latest shiny thing in psychiatry, psychedelics, it ain't working no more. 
And now we need to invest all our money in, in VR AI assisted therapy. Right. And I think that the, the reason that comes up for me is because Okay, use the, the, the cannabis example. Um, you know, when you mentioned Lars around that there's a lack of, of incentive for more research, it, you know, I, I don't know whether the, that incentive has to, like this perpetual incentive for the, for the market to keep growing is part of the problem, I think. And I think that the whole conversation we're having here is about alternative modes of approaching things. Because when do we stop? When do we, let's say we're 20 years from now, there's psychedelic clinics everywhere, pretty much every indication is covered. When do we stop that? And, and like, if we have an incentive structure that is to keep it growing, we need to keep giving people reasons to take psychedelics. So we just think we need to have billboards like, hey, you feeling upset? Yeah, just like, go through a breakup, LSD. That's the problem. The, the problem is the inbuilt incentive structure. And this is not an anti-capitalist argument so much as a perverse incentive argument. Um, and it's the so I think to prevent it going that way is is to to clean up the incentive structure uh, now before it's too late. I think look uh, I think again we need to discriminate between mainstreaming psychedelics for anyone who wants to work on their own insights, better understanding themselves, their place in the world, and people that are suffering from severe mental illness, which is our focus at the moment. Um, and I think. Uh, uh, again, I think that needs the funding required that we were talking about and the incentives um, to actually deliver the research. Um, one point that you made is, is probably true that I wanted to go back to, right? When you talk about, you know, why is the world suffering? You know, why is mental health exploding? And I agree with everything you said, right? It's a disease of disconnection from ourselves, from our environment, um, from nature, et cetera. And I think, you know, the, the benefit that psychedelics have and research has shown that is that people better understand how to lead their lives, what the real priorities are. And so if, if, if people really believe in kind of the power of psychedelics to help people rectify um, their perception of what's important in their life, right? Then I would say, you know, we're all in the same boat, right? If people come out of these experiences better understanding themselves, their place in the world, um, that it's better to spend time with the people that are closest to you, that matter to you, instead of, you know, running after the next shiny thing, I think, you know, then our goals uh, of helping patients are aligned with your goals and bringing about a psychedelic uh, renaissance, right? And so I don't feel that there is a disconnection between the kind of the objectives of the wider psychedelic community and the psychedelic uh, medicalization. I did want to move on to more questions just in the interest of time. Um, this one does relate to the previous discussion uh, about whether what we should do um, once there's no longer an incentive to take psychedelics, um, as well as the earlier discussion in Oregon. The question is from Flores. She's asking, uh, should one be allowed to use psychedelics without having any quote unquote disease? Are you worried that putting it in the medical field might be too narrow? Yeah, I think, look, uh, again, uh, we're a mental health care company, right? That's really important. I think, we, you know, we're not a, a psychedelics mainstreaming company. Um, you know, if, if, if there was any other treatment that was equally uh, promising as psilocybin, we would also develop that treatment if it doesn't deliver the psychedelic experience. Now we believe psilocybin happens to be one of the best treatments for patients. That's not to say that, you know, we would be opposing people accessing psychedelics outside of uh, mental health treatments. It's just not what we are doing, right? And that's why, you know, we applaud all the efforts out there, right? The decrim efforts that are very successful at the moment in the United States, and you know, maybe something like that can take shape here. And I think what Alexander said is, you know, we need to eventually answer the question, why are all, why is the whole world getting depressed, um, anxious, developing neuroses, et cetera, right? And um, because that is what's happening, right? COVID has further worsened that, and um, we got to deal with that, that that mental health crisis. And I think psychedelics uh, will be part of the solution. But as you said, it's not a magic bullet, right? I think that's also important that people understand it's not, you know, popping a pill and, you know, resetting your brain and you're good to go, right? It, it takes work. Uh, people need to be actually willing to engage with the therapy. It needs a lot of very skilled therapists to work with these patients. Uh, we need the infrastructure for that. Now, I believe uh, over the course of a lifetime, right? Kind of what, what our mantra is encompass everybody has a story. Either yourself have has experienced some mental health suffering or someone in your family has experienced it or a circle of friends. Everybody's touched by this directly or indirectly. 
Now, this happens over the course of our lives, right? We get traumatized by events. We're stuck in a situation of learned helplessness. Um, there's a situation we can't free ourselves from. And so we will always go through these, these waves. Now, that's where psychedelics could be very useful, right? Especially in terms of times of turbulent change. And the question is eventually, you know, could these treatments be given uh, preventatively? You know, that we don't have to wait for someone to end up in a severe uh, mental health crisis, right? Is there a way that these substances could actually be seen as more of a mental health vaccine? The only place to go there is through research um, and answering these questions. Otherwise, the regulators will not entertain that thought. Yeah. Um, I'm a big believer in um, the necessity of clinics and churches. Um, and I think we're only at the beginning of the, um, right now, right now, because of medicalization, psychiatry and, and the regulatory bodies have the say over access in terms of someone gets psychedelics because they're sick. Now, I think that's, a, that's by itself an issue. I think sometimes they're right, rightly placed to do that. But I think, like we were talking about with a crisis of meaning, what, what if someone's rabbi says, you know, what's really wrong with them is that they have a deep, they're in a deep space of mistrust with God and they need a psilocybin session that we do in our way to reconnect them to that. That is also now uh, going to be like, oh, those things can and should coexist, but they have to coexist if we're in a flourishing ecosystem. And, you know, Lars, I think it's, I think what I'm feeling is, is, is kind of, I know we're close to end ending, but what I'd love to just, touch on and hear from you is, you know, Compass is a, is a significant part of the psychedelic ecosystem right now. You know, you're not separate from it. Um, and sometimes I felt a little bit like you guys are a big bear and you're being like, well, you know, we're just, you know, er like, you know, we want everyone to be kind of, you know, flourishing in the ecosystem, but the, but the bear, especially with the, <laughs> with the kind of press and the patenting strategy, it's very scary to a lot of people and, and scary, you know, people are also worried perhaps needlessly about what role compass might play say 10 years down the line in decrim etc like are uh, is it your intention not to go after say usona or other companies uh, for their patents is it is it is a kind of do you want that kind of ecosystem or it, i would love to just hear from you what what the intention is yeah yeah, look, I think uh, going back to your point, right, if the rabbi uh, decides that you're, have a spiritual, you're having a spiritual crisis, right, um, and you should access psilocybin, I think that's great. Um, it's not what we do, right? Uh, I think this, this would be a desirable world where people have freedom over their consciousness and they can do whatever they want. Again, I, to me, the, the problem is not psychedelics, right, on that question. It's, uh, you know, if, in a... If, in a grown-up society, right, I, I feel that people, as long as the, they don't touch the freedom of others, they should be free to do whatever they want, right? And I, I feel, you know, humanity is slowly moving in that direction. Some countries faster, some countries slower. I'm hopeful we're going to get there. Now, what role does Compass play in that? Uh, we're clearly not opposing this. Uh, we're supporting that. I think Decrim is a great uh, initiative. Uh, you know, there are great examples here. When you look at Portugal, it has shown they got rid of the opioid crisis through decriminalization and treating people with addiction, not as criminals, but as people that are suffering. Uh, the Czech Republic has shown that this model is replicable. And um, I think that, you know, I hope the world overall moves towards um, that direction. Now, how can Compass help and all the other players, right? We were very much focused on Compass, but again, there are 200 psychedelic companies out there. I hope what it does is, right, when you see millions of people suffering today, hopefully being able in a couple of years' time to access psychedelic therapy, they will be out there with their stories, right? And you see that now. You see that in the trials that Robin Card Harris had done with TRD. There are some amazing vocal patients that have come out of it and said, look, this is how much psilocybin therapy has helped me. We're seeing the same now in the MDD trial where patients are out there talking about it. And, you know, this will create a huge wave of advocacy. When I think about this, you know, if we fast forward, you know, 10 years down the road, you have psychedelic treatment centers in every little village, people that are suffering are able to legally access this, maybe decrim. No, then you have all the arguments, you're probably going to have the population behind you to make a case and say Psych psychedelics should be uh, available for everyone. We have a framework, we have places to go to, this can be done safely. So I think, you know, the more successful the psychedelic uh, renaissance on the medicalization side is, the more successful all other movements will be. So 
again, it's uh, the, the rising tide will lift all boats here. So I'm extremely positive about the overall field. Thanks, Lars. I noticed, I, I have to say, if this is coming up in the chat, I noticed you didn't mention whether you would sue uh, companies if, if, if you, you know, if you. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, absolutely. Look, we would absolutely enforce our IP, right? I mean, it, otherwise, we wouldn't file for IP. So I think that's really important. We've always, I've always said that. And um, uh, again, right, I think that's, uh, we're not going to talk about any active litigation. We're never going to go after any researcher, clinic provider, et cetera. Um, if somebody is infringing uh, on, on our concrete IP, um, eventually this could lead to a case of litigation, um, but I don't have a crystal ball and I can't answer what the future will look like. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. I wanted to um, shift to another question from Ada. This is also relating to the discussion on just, you know, how people can get access to psychedelic medicine broadly. Would in promotion of many independent uh, psychedelic clinics and centers help to deliver therapy to multitudes of people fast rather than one or several companies dominating the market? And again, this goes back to what you were talking about, Ali, at the beginning, um, the old game being the monopoly um, taking control of um, psychedelic medicine. The question is about treatment center, Kenneth. Did I get that right? Yes, um, psychedelic clinics and centers. Yeah, I think you know you're gonna as as everywhere you're gonna see an explosion of centers. Uh, you see that today in the United States, which is, I believe, from everything we're seeing, the farthest advanced with ketamine, different ways of administering ketamine, also in a psychedelic uh, container, uh, in a way with preparation and integration in some of these clinics. Others are pure places of administration. I think there there's going to be a winning model in the end, but. Uh, Again, right when we when we look at the delivery of um, psychotherapy, I think that's a great analogy here. Um, you have hundreds and hundreds of players, um, and so you're going to see the same with psychedelic uh, therapy uh, providers. Yeah, I mean, I think I spoke to this point. This is kind of the my entire uh, framing from the beginning. So I would just reiterate that I think a healthy ecosystem with a multidisciplinary approach, where very actually similar to something like the American constitution where you create something anti-fragile, i.e. resilient from the outset so that there's many different approaches. And that for me is where innovation happens. It's, it's multiple different perspectives happening at the same time um, that are free to do that and don't have uh, regulatory hurdles or other professional hurdles to, to, to overcome. And I think the, the big question that none of us have solved yet is how to take the best of the medical model, which is regulation and making sure that people, you know, if you're a bad doctor, you're a bad psychologist, there are consequences for that. If you're a bad underground healer, you don't really have consequences for that. Maybe eventually um, you get called out, but like, you know, there's a lot of harm in the underground as well. Uh, there's a lot of harm in the medical system too, you know, iatrogenic illness. So illness that's caused by medicine is, is a, you know, a significant problem, but overall, you know, I wouldn't go for surgery um, just like in a back alley with some guy with a scalpel because I'm like, well, you know, that's crazy. So I think figuring out as we have clinics, churches, whatever other iteration of places people go for healing or growth that we have some, uh, yeah, like I was gonna say ethics pledge, but it's more than that because it has to have teeth. It has to have consequences to it. It has to be some sense of regulation, but then the question is who regulates it? And that's a big open question. Um, so, I, but I think there's, again, space for innovation in that. There's, there's new ways to do it. I mean, I 100% agree with you, Alexander. I think this is, you know, I've been shocked, quite frankly, with some of the stories I heard from the underground, but also from therapists that have been involved in some of the uh, clinical trials with, uh, with MDMA um, of what has happened in terms of abuse and mischief making with patients. I think that's horrible. Uh, if you think about people that, you know, some of these patients, uh, uh, are so depressed, they're close to uh, suicidal ideation, right? And, and they're in such a fragile state, um, they need to be protected at, at all costs. But that's where I say, you know, that's why we're doing what we're doing. That's where regulation comes in, right? Uh, good example is we're, we're video recording, audio recording uh, every session for the benefit of the patient. So they know exactly, even if they have been completely dissociated during the experience or whatever happened to them, that they will be able to see what uh, the conduct of the therapist in the session uh, has been, for example. And so I think this is uh, this is crucially important. And I think that is one thing when we think about the overall movement, right, where this could be shut down, right? 
uh, a couple of things that go wrong um, uh, in terms of abuse or people doing stupid things on psychedelics. You know, thousands of people are doing stupid things on alcohol every weekend, right? And uh, nobody cares, but the spotlight will be on psychedelics. And I think that's something that, that we as an overall field uh, need to be very careful with to uh, do anything in our power to prevent any, any of that uh, from happening. I think MAPS is doing some amazing work at the moment and uh, educating law enforcement in states that are decriminalizing how to deal with people that are freaking out during a psychedelic experience and how to calm them down, et cetera. Those are great, uh, great initiatives. Now, I just, I'm scrolling through the uh, chat here. There was, I think there was a question, you know, are we opposed to decriminalization in Oregon? Absolutely not. Um, you know, we're, um, we're, we're very much in favor of, uh, of decriminalization, uh, 100%. Yeah, just briefly to, to your point, Lars, just um, I think it's the the yes and, right? I think it's always important because as well as having bad stuff happening in the underground, uh, there's also, you know, incredible indigenous healers, there's incredible people in the underground. I've spoken personally to people running clinical trials who've spoken to underground therapists because they have just far more experience than anybody else. So I think that's, that's a really important um, Point to make and, and equally the, the fact is that there are incentives in the medicalization model that are also difficult to navigate you know because there's an incentive right now as well uh to whether anyone's acted on it i don't know but there's an incentive to not talk too much about adverse events because everyone wants to get this stuff through um and also there's there's an incentive to not to to, to also um it, this is all this happens with all science i don't think it's just the psychedelic space but there's an incentive for studies to be interpreted a certain way for data to be interpreted a certain way money in science is a huge issue as well and so there, there's something i my sense is that there is there is a, a new very a, a new form of being able to bring psychedelics into the mainstream which accounts for all this complexity and and never boils it down into one way of knowing because really this is a question of power it's a question of who is in control of access, who has the decision over access. And I think that that's why for me, an ecosystem where power is dispersed evenly, like, like the US constitution, this was the question they had, how do you prevent bad actors? How do you create a system where power can't accumulate too much in one area? And it just about worked even with Trump. I mean, it's still almost broke, but sort of <laughs> just about worked. So astonishing things can happen when we all sit down and figure out how do we really want this to, to roll out. And that, that's where my concern with the speed at which everything is happening comes from, because I think there's just so much we don't know. I agree. Look, I mean, they're amazing, you know, to your point, they're amazing underground therapists. There's a lot to be learned from them. You know, we're, we're blessed to be working with some of the people that have done psychedelic research in the 1960s and 70s already. Uh, Bill Richards is one of our therapist trainers in the United States, now doing research at Hopkins. Now, obviously, he has a lot of experience under his belt, and there's a lot to be learned from him from, for young therapists. That's why we're working with these uh, people. And, uh, you know, again, a lot is uh, culturally influenced and uh, should be put uh, to research, right? We should figure out what works, what doesn't work. Uh, we should, you know, find all different places for um, generating innovation that can be, can be tested. I think that's, that's where research comes in. Um, you know, I think... I actually see this uh, space very much distributed, right? You have the decriminalization efforts, you have the legalization efforts, you have the underground, uh, you have the companies um, uh, developing this, you have the uh, infrastructure being rolled out. So, um, you know, I believe in free markets and I think, you know, over the, the course of the next 10 years, the most promising uh, model for, for patients and then for people that generally want to access psychedelics will win. Um, and, and eventually the customer decides in any market, right? It's not gonna be the company superimposing the best model. It's gonna, the vote is uh, on the, uh, with the therapist, uh, with the patient and, and with the consumer. Great. Um, I know we've got tons of more questions from the audience, but we are um, five minutes away from the end of the event uh, and we've covered a lot of different threads today. So I was wondering if our two speakers just wanted to give some uh, final closing thoughts to wrap everything up. I think I went first at the beginning. So maybe if, if Lars, you wanted to go, go for first. it, go for it, Ali. Yeah. 
No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm handing, handing it to Lars to, to throw it like that. Yeah, look, I, you know, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today and, and to receive all these questions and, and be able to answer them. Uh, I want to reiterate, you know, we're, you know, we're in it to create a world of mental well-being. Uh, we're deeply focused on patients. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're in our uh, mission statement, we were saying that we're all about uh, accelerating access to evidence-based innovation and mental health. And I think that's what I want to make clear again is, you know, we're not in the a wider let's legalize psychedelics movement. Um, we leave that to others that are much better in that than we are. Um, our focus is on medicalization and really getting psilocybin therapy and uh, in the future other uh, therapies uh, to patients at an affordable price. Um, now again, when we think about the wider psychedelic fields, uh, many ro roads lead to Rome. Um, you know, many I, I believe that this will be a thriving ecosystem where many players can be successful. And you know, I, I, I would hope that we inspire a couple of people to also come up with innovative solutions. Um, uh, I feel there's a lot of blame out there, and uh, and I feel that there's very little solution offered and very little innovation happening. Uh, where I feel this this is a space uh, that needs people that go out there, that start clinics, that start new companies, uh, and get really involved, uh, not only in activism but in doing things and. Uh, I think we can do that together. I, I enjoy these conversations. There was a lot of food for thought that I'm going to take on board and think about. So uh, thank you very much for your time tonight. Yeah, I wanted to say thank you, Lars, for, for taking the time as well. I know you haven't done um, so so many of these uh, recently. It's, it's much appreciated. It's been good to, uh, to actually have a conversation around it. So um, yeah, my just what comes up for me is is that like my hope for the psychedelic renaissance beyond and in including medicalization is that the psychedelic, the promise of psychedelics and the way they change how we see ourselves and the world um, spreads through culture. I think that's the real promise of them. And, and, you know, I don't, I'm not a fan of the word well-being so much because I don't know what we're being well for. Um, I'm not sure this is a culture worth being well for right now. Um, but I think psychedelics give us the creativity, the insight, the energy, the rebellious attitude uh, and the magic to, to figure out what that is. And I think that's where we're at realistically is figuring out who are we, where are we going? Why are we so sick? Um, and that's what I want psychedelics to, to do, um, not to do. I mean, <laughs> to, to inspire us towards is probably a better way to say it. And um, yeah, and, and together with that is a sense of a kind of psychedelic approach to how they're mainstreamed and this kind of multiplicity and complexity to it. So that's, that's what my kind of deepest hope is for the space. Well said. Thank you, Alexander, for the debate. It's like yeah, and with that, yeah, I really want to thank Lars uh, and Alexander for joining us today. Um, it's been a real treat to hear from you both. Um, and uh, thank you so much to all the audience members for attending. We'll see you at our next event. Thanks so much. Have a good night. Bye. Bye. Take care.